Let's stand together and read the Word of God. 1 Peter chapter 3. Understand, Peter the Apostle is writing here. He's not writing to a specific church. It's what's known as a general letter. Instead of writing to like a church in the city of Corinth or the church in the city of Colossae or Rome, he's writing to Christians in general. And he's writing them specifically about issues that relate to how do they behave under persecution? How do they behave when they are uh, treated badly because of their faith in Jesus? And you know, just this morning as I was getting ready, I saw the corner of my eye, I had the news on, and there was a picture on the television of a line of Coptic Christians, Egyptian Christians, that were standing or kneeling before the ISIS executors who were getting ready to murder them for their faith. That was on the news this morning. So we live in a world that's not neutral toward Jesus Christ. And it's real today. And Peter was writing to say, okay, how do you respond to that as believers effectively to brag on Jesus in the midst of that kind of situation? Well, let's take this excerpt from his writings. Let's read together. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Amen. You may be seated. Now, how might we summarize in a sentence what Peter is advising these believers in the face of persecution how to respond? How might we summarize it? Well, I would suggest we could summarize it this way. That in essence, Peter is saying, don't give anybody a reason not to follow Jesus because of the way you live or treat them. Don't give anybody a reason not to follow Jesus because of the way you live or the way you treat them. Has anybody ever heard anybody say, maybe you've said yourself, has anybody ever heard anybody say, you know, I, I'm not going to church because the church is full of hypocrites. You heard that one? Well, what is actually meant by that? What's meant by that is that people are saying, you know, I've been around people who claim to be Christians and I don't really see anything different in their life than mine. I don't really see anything different about them. And it seems to me that what they talk about is a lot different than the way they live. So if being a part of church doesn't do any more for them than that, why do I need it? Because they're no different than me. That's the essence of that accusation. Now, I know that's a convenient excuse much of the time, but the sad part of the story is, is that that excuse didn't grow out of thin air. It grew out of real relationships and real behavior on a part of people who claim to be Christ followers. Here's the point. If you truly are a believer in Jesus Christ, you should make sure that your life doesn't inhibit anybody's ability to follow Jesus. Make sure that you don't do anything that would give peace, people a reason not to follow Jesus because of the way you live or treat them. Now, having said that as a summary, in a positive way, how could we say what Peter is saying? <coughs> Excuse me. In a positive way, we could say, you need to brag on Jesus in everything you do because everybody needs to know who Jesus is. 
That's the positive side of the coin. That's what Peter's saying. Now, in, re- in light of that, then, the heart of what he's saying here in this passage that we've read, and the way that we are most effective in giving a people a reason to follow Jesus in the midst of difficult situations, is that we are ready to give an answer for the reason of the hope that's within us. In other words, when and if people ask a question, we need to have an answer. And the key word in this, let's go back one. I got ahead of you. The key word in this is the word apologia. Apologia. It's the word apology in English. And it's the word from which the word apologetics is derived. And it's a word that in the original Greek that Peter wrote in is used in the original that's translated into the English answer. Apologia is, apo is a preposition meaning from, and logia is referring to word. So it's a word from a word. It's an answer. It's a response. And so, again, what Peter is saying is when and if, because of your behavior that demonstrates Christ, when and if they ask, why are you different? Are you prepared to convincingly answer their question? When and if they ask, why are you different? Are you prepared to convincingly answer their question? In other words, how do we make a powerful case for faith in Jesus Christ? How do we do that? How how is that accomplished in the face of people who oppose our faith in Jesus or question our faith in Jesus, but yet recognize that our life demonstrates the reality of Jesus? Well, I think the easiest way to answer that question would be to answer the question, how did Jesus defend Himself? How did Jesus respond in the face of persecution, accusation, and confirm His own identity? Well, the greatest example we see of that is when Jesus was in the the, uh, desert uh, and He was tempted by the devil. Forty days Jesus fasted, and the devil came and tempted him. And he tempted him with accusation. If you are the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. Jesus had fasted 40 days. No doubt he was hungry. I've fasted, but it's been nowhere near 40 days. The most I've made is three days. And believe me, I was ready to eat. I can't imagine how hungry you'd be at 40 days. This confirms the humanity of Jesus, his appetite. And the devil tempted him with food. And Jesus answered, read it with me. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then the devil takes him to a high place, the pinnacle of the temple, and says, throw yourself down, because after all, the Bible says in Psalm 91, that the angels will bear you up and you won't strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus then responds. Read it with me. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. You see, there's a difference between faith and presumption. There's a difference between faith and presumption. Faith is trusting God appropriately. Presumption is the assumption that we are entitled to God's blessing and protection. And there's a radical difference between the two. And Jesus understood that, and He referred to Scripture that confirmed that. And then the devil says, you fall down and worship me, and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. And how does Jesus respond? 
Read it with me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. You see, Jesus let the Bible do His talking for Him. Jesus let the Bible do His talking for Him. So Peter says, be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks for the hope that's in you. And we take a cue from Jesus as we remember the lecture soundbite that we heard earlier about the myth of neutrality. Is you don't take the Bible out of the formula. You start with and you stay with the Word of God. That is the answer for the hope that's within us. And that's the answer that Jesus gave. Jesus let the Bible do His talking for Him, and you should too. You should too. That's why as Deltona Alliance Church, we have ministries, life group ministries, of all different descriptions. There are brochures at the Information Center about that. And all of those life groups, in some way, shape, form, or fashion, are built around the ability to help you better learn and apply the Word of God. To better learn and apply to your life the Word of God. Because Jesus had a sure answer from the Word, and that's a great model for us to follow as we fulfill Peter's directions. So why is the Bible the best response? Well, let me give you some examples. Psalm 119. What do you know about Psalm 119? Well, it's the longest chapter in your Bible. The longest chapter in your Bible. And Psalm 119 is a a prayer of thanks to God. And you know what it's all about? It's all about the Bible. The whole psalm is a prayer about the Bible. And it's a beautiful piece of poetry. In fact, it's written in an acrostic format with eight stanzas in each section And each of the sections are divided by a letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And each word in each of those eight stanzas starts with the same letter that's assigned to the stanza. It's a brilliant piece of literature. And it's a prayer to God in thanks for His Word. And in verses 98 through 100, we have three reasons why the Bible is the best response when asked for a reason to follow Jesus Christ. First of all, look at verse 98. Read it with me. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are my constant guide. Notice notice the psalmist didn't say, I'm so smart I'm wiser than my enemies. You know, intelligence and wisdom are two different things. You, You can be very intelligent and not be wise. Wisdom is seeing life from God's perspective, and wisdom is making short-term decisions in light of long-term consequences as opposed to short-term convenience. That's wisdom. That's the application of wisdom. And what the psalmist is saying is that God's Word, just by knowing the Bible, he was able to be spared the success of his enemies against him. He was able to successfully defend himself against his enemies simply because he brought to bear the Word of God on the situation that he was facing. God's Word made him wiser than his enemies. And then, verse 99. Read it with me. Yes, I have more insight than my teachers, for I am always thinking of your laws. Isn't that amazing? Because of the knowledge of the Word of God, the psalmist said that he had better insight than even those who taught him. Because his greatest teacher was the Bible. His greatest teacher was the Bible. I once heard a testimony from a man who was a medical doctor. And obviously it was a real challenge to successfully complete medical school. And he said that, that, he, he, that no doubt... That, that his success in c- completing medical school was exclusively due to the fact that he continually 
reflected on and memorized God's Word all the way through medical school. He didn't, even though he had to memorize huge volumes of information to successfully complete those courses, he never stopped remembering and meditating on the Word of God. And he said, I'm convinced it helped my mind function appropriately and successfully. He said, I'm convinced of that. More insight than teachers. And then thirdly, why else is it the best response to use the Word of God to any question about why we should follow Jesus? Well, look at verse 100. Let's read it together. I am even wiser than my elders, for I have kept your commandments. Have you ever said or have you ever heard it said that uh, experience is the best teacher? Somebody said that they had a Ph.D. from the School of Hard Knocks. And they had really, and that's true. Experience is the great teacher. And there's no substitute for experience except the Word of God. Knowing this book and applying its truth to our life is even more valuable than experience. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. So, there is no issue in life that you will ever face that is not addressed by a truth in God's Word. Nothing that will ever be uh, addressed that won't be answered, a question that won't be answered either by a direct truth or a principle from God's Word to be applied. Now, how do, we, let me give us, how do we give examples of this? What does this look like? Well, anybody ever run across anybody who says, uh, I don't believe in God? Anybody ever heard that one? I don't believe in God. Don't believe there's a God. Well, now, there, there's, a, there's an interesting conversation that could last for days, right? Does that sometimes happen? Well, you try to reason... Listen, there's a simple response. Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Game over. Game over. Now, you say, well, don't call me... I didn't call you a fool. The Bible called you a fool. Deal with it. And then... Just this past week, it's been all over the news. I've seen, I've seen it advertised. There, there was a movie came out, Fifty Shades of Hell. No, I'm sorry, Fifty Shades of Grey. That's a, a movie version of a pornographic novel. I, it, based on what I, I haven't read it, <laughs> praise God. But listen, the whole world is going to see that. And you could rationalize and reason, well, you know, this is something I can handle. Listen to me. You can talk yourself into anything. And the devil can talk you into anything. That's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve neglected what God had plainly said and let the devil talk them into and out of the Garden of Eden. Say, well, should I go to that movie? Well, Psalm 103.3, I will not put anything wicked in front of my eyes. I hate what unfaithful people do. I want no part of it. Game over. No more discussion. Final verdict's in. The Word of God is spoken. It's not a debatable issue from the Bible's perspective. And then... How many times anybody ever say, well, you know, I'm a Christian, but I don't have to go to church. You know, I can worship God. I remember I used to, when, in, in my younger days, uh, before I married, I enjoyed uh, going to the lake and, and had a bunch of guys, and we'd go snorkeling and scuba diving and everything. We'd, we had a great time. I always enjoyed going to the lake. And these other guys that I went with, you know, none of them went to church. And we'd, Sunday, I'd always come late. And they, you know... Give me, hey, Brad, you know, you can worship God. I can worship God out here on the lake. <laughs> I said, well, do you?
No, they didn't worship God on the lake. In fact, it was the opposite of that. I'm not going to go into what they did, but it definitely wasn't worship. But anybody, you ever run across that similar thing? The Bible says, Hebrews 10, 25, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as is the habit of some, but encourage you one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And, and folks, I'm going to tell you something. The day is drawing near. You know, we'll know for sure about prophecy when it happens, but I'm going to tell you something. When I go in the kitchen and my wife's got eggs and flour and sugar and food coloring on the counter, I know a cake is in the works. <laughs> and when I watch the news and I see everything happen in Israel and I see everything happen in Iraq and in Babylon and all over the world, and et cetera, et cetera, there's a cake being made somewhere. And all the more as we see the day drawing near. Listen to me. The Bible commands us to assemble together as believers. There is no such thing in the Bible as a lone ranger follower of Christ. It is a team sport. End of story. That's not debatable. For to sake not the assembling yourselves together. And then, well, the Bible is fabricated. The Bible's fabricated. Yeah, I know what it says, but somebody just made it up. Well, Matthew 28, 17. When they saw him, they worshipped him. After the resurrection, this is talking about after Jesus' resurrection. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Let me tell you something. If I'm going to invent something, I'm not going to include the fact that the main character was doubted by some of the other main characters. I'm not going to include that if I'm trying to pull the wool over somebody's eyes. And then, and then the last one, I'll share this, and, 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 and the reason I, this takes a minute, but I, I feel like we need to do it because it, anybody ever heard the one, well, you know, God is really not just. I mean, look, look there, if you read in Joshua how God commanded the Israelites to go in and kill all of them, even the babies, and, you know, what kind of God is that, and I don't like that idea, and yada, have anybody ever heard that one? Right? Right? Well, Instead of trying to reason through it, let the Bible answer that question. Genesis 15, 16. God had told Abram, he was making a covenant with him, and he said that his descendants would be going into another country. And it says, verse 16, But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. God was going to give Israel the Holy Land, to the descendants of Abram. But he said they were going to have to go into Egypt for 400 years because it all belonged to God. God do whatever He wanted with it anytime He wanted to, but in His perfect justice, He was not going to turn that land over to the Israelites until He was absolutely just in doing so, and the sin of those people had reached a level of depravity that was beyond the point of no return. And it was going to take 400 years for that to happen. God in His omniscience knows when somebody is beyond recovery in their sin. All sin is deadly. All sin is equally destructive. But sin has levels of depravity. It at Romans chapter 1. John chapter 19, based on culpability. John chapter 9, etc., etc., etc. Sin, has, just like cancer, is cancer, but there are stages of it, right? And the stages are stages of development of the expanse of the disease. But everybody, we're all born into sin. Had something happen this week. A great theological statement from my three-year-old grandson. Theological insight. One day a week, my wife keeps our three-year-old grandson. And this week she reported to me, don't ever remember this, he'll shoot me when he gets older for telling this story, I'm sure. But she reported to me that she was keeping him this week, and, one, and he just asked the question, Who, who's the boss here? <laughs> who's the boss? And she says, well, I am. And then he says, three years old, he says, I want to be my own boss. Well. 
At least he's honest. We try to hide. Nobody taught him that. You know where he got it? He got it from me. Yeah, you know, the sin nature is not passed through the mother. Jesus is sinless. And Mary was his mother. Now that doesn't let you women off the hook. The sin nature is passed through the father. He learned how to do that from me. We're all born addicted to ourselves. That's called sin. And that addiction has levels of degrees, if you will, of expansion and manifestation in our life. What we need to understand is that inside every one of us is an Adolf Hitler. But only by the grace of God and the blood of Jesus Christ is that checked and overpowered. But anyway, okay, sin had not reached a level of depravity. Let me move quickly. Go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 5 or 6, 5. Okay, Assyria was over, overran the northern kingdom of Israel in 721 B.C. Here's what God says about it. Woe to Assyria. Assyria was not a godly people. They didn't even know the God of Israel existed. They could care less. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. God used Assyria to bring judgment on Israel. You go to 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 17. You find he says the same thing about Babylon when Babylon overthrew Judah, the southern kingdom. Babylon was his instrument to bring his judgment. And then you go to Matthew... And you find in Mark and Luke and John, and you find that Pilate, the Roman governor, sent Jesus out to be crucified. Who crucified Jesus? The Roman government. They're the ones who whipped him. They're the ones who executed him. And it's on Jesus that the wrath of God was poured out for sin. The wrath of God for your sin and mine was poured out by the Roman government. Just as God used the Roman government as instruments of His wrath and justice and judgment on Jesus for our sin, He used the Babylonians against the Judeans. He used the Assyrians against the uh, nation of Israel. And then He used also the Israelites against the Amorites when Joshua took the land. God in perfect justice uses any means he wants because God owns it all. So the Bible has a response. So what does this look like? That we, what does it look like that we give an answer to those who ask? I'm going to ask Pastor Juan to come up. We've, we've got just a minute here, Pastor Juan. We've got a baptism we're excited about this morning. But I want you to talk about your employment experience. You, you used to work where? Disney. As in Walt Disney World? As in Walt Disney World, yes. Juan is Disney-holic. <laughs> hey, if you, ever want, if you ever want, call his phone, get the answer, voice, voicemail. It's his monorail voice. He was a monorail driver. Plus, if you ever, hey, you need somebody to do Mickey Mouse? He is the guy. He called me the other day and left a voicemail, and it was Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Would you want to do that real quick for him? I don't know if I got it this morning. Uh, oh, so. you haven't got it. Okay. <laughs> All right. But anyway, Juan, Juan, we're, give an answer to those who ask for the hope that's in you. Sure. Juan's got a, a great story about what that looks like when you worked at Disney. Go for sure, it. Sure. Absolutely. Well, I was 19 years old and in college, and I decided, uh, all growing up, I always wanted to work there and drive the monorail. And so um, I set out and did that, and uh, it was really cool. I, it'd be really cool if I could sit here and say I was on a mission from God to work at Disney. And that was my ambition at the time, <laughs> but I really just wanted to go pilot the monorail. That was, that was my bag. So, um, and, and God gave me the opportunity but meanwhile, during all that time in my life, I was really plugged in in church. Um, I happened to be teaching a seventh grade boys Sunday school class at my home church, you know, growing in my relationship with Christ. Um, but really excited because I'm at Disney driving a monorail. And so um, 
when you work someplace, especially a place like that, that's unique, I mean, any, any job you work at, um, the longer you're there, you develop relationships with people. And so we'd have, we'd have eight, 10 hour, 12 hour shifts, whatever. And so you really get to, you know, you gravitate to other guys that are your age and, and, and you just develop relationships with them. And, um, I didn't do it for any, any reason, except for, I just, I like people. I, I've always loved people. And, and I guess people like me, uh, they get along with me and, and uh, so we, we just love hanging out and having a good time while we're working. I mean, we're working at Disney for crying out loud. You got to have a good time, right? So we did. And, um, and through those relationships, um, God just kind of gave me an opportunity. And I didn't even realize what was taking place. But because I was growing in my relationship with Christ and, and um, learning more about him and about, you know, life is all about following Jesus, um, it was through those relationships God, God used me uh, as, a, as a tool. And this is even before, you know, a lot of people say, well, of course, you're going to say that you're a pastor now. This is before it, God called me to ministry. Oh, it's, it's better if you're not a pastor. Yeah. Yeah, That's well, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Actually, you know, <laughs> carries more weight. Um, and so, you know, we would hang out and, you know, guys talk and we would do stuff and, you know, they would use certain language, but I wouldn't use it. You know, I just... That's not what I did, you know, so I, I didn't use certain language that they used, but we were, we were cool. We were still buddies and all that stuff. I didn't preach at them. I didn't say, you shouldn't say that. You know, I didn't do those kind of things. Um, but, you know, there was even, and how we talked about the ladies, okay? I'm in college, for crying out loud. Now, I, I happened to just start dating Amanda at that time, right? When I started working at Disney, I happened to start dating Amanda at that time, and I was real excited about dating her, but, you know, when you work at a place where people come from all over the world, there's very attractive women that come from all over the world. And so monorail pilots had a, had a 10 code for the ladies. So whenever we saw an attractive lady, you would hear 914. There's a 914 on the right-hand side of forward motion or whatever. Uh, you know? Too bad. Hey, yeah. I got this messed up after the first service, and I saw Amanda in the hallway, and I told her that Juan said she was a 941. <laughs> I got it messed up. You no. know, and so, you know, that, that's kind of taken place. And, you know, we'd we, we kid around about, yeah, you know, 914, all that stuff. But when it really got down to it, some of the guys would talk a little bit graphically about these ladies, you know. But I wouldn't engage in those conversations. But I was there, but I didn't, I didn't really engage. And when I would, and, and I... Like I said, I was real excited about dating Amanda, so I talked about her a lot. But when I talked about her, I talked about her with respect, the way that, that, that God would want you to. And so it basically got down to the point where sometimes the guys would, you know, it would be just me and one of the guys, and they'd be like, there's just something different about you, man. Is something wrong, you know. And I, I'm like, no, man. He says, well, you, you know, you, you always got a good attitude. You don't say a lot of bad things. You know, what is it? And, and really, that just kind of gave me a, a wide open door to talk about who I really live for and, and to get to talk about Jesus. And like I said, I didn't realize what was happening there, but it just kind of naturally happened. And I remember one, and I got a, a lot of stories, but I'll tell one. And again, this is, I'm not trying to toot my horn. This is just something that well, is just hey, looking we, back. And, let's and, assume this is because of Jesus in you, not because of one. Absolutely. That's your full-grown yeah. follower, Jesus yeah, will come absolutely. out. absolutely. That's right. No. Um, but one of the guys I got to be really close to, you know, he would always ask me questions. He'd ask me questions about Christ. He'd ask me questions about church. And I'm 19, 20, 21 years old. So I'm growing, and I know a, a good amount, but there's a lot of things I didn't know. But we would just talk, and we'd, we'd talk about Scripture. And one of the things that would come across one of the passages of Scripture was Romans 12, 2. And Romans 12, 2 says, uh, Do not be conformed by this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind in Christ, so on and so forth. I'm paraphrasing, but you get the, the point. That a relationship with Christ transforms you to where you're not conforming to the ways of the world, but you're becoming more like Jesus and the person that he wants you to be. And so we, were, we got to be really close. Um, he actually went, had a, 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 a tragedy happen in his life early on in his marriage, in his relationship um, with his wife. They had, a, they had a stillborn child. And I got to be there for them and, and minister to him. And, and I didn't really, I didn't have answers. I was just there. I was just a brother. And uh, so, you know, God got him through that. 
And, uh, you know, I left the company, and Amanda and I moved off to Texas, and so I wasn't working at Disney anymore and lost touch with the guy. And, but during our relationship there, I, you know, I'd always talk about Jesus and answer questions and just talk about how, you know, Jesus is who we need to give our lives to. We need to follow him. And to make a long story short, you know, this thing called Facebook was developed. And so I hopped on the social media deal, and, and after a couple of years of being on Facebook, I found my buddy. And so we reconnected. And, you know, when you go on people's profiles, you can kind of see what, what's going on in their lives, what, you know, what they're all about. And come to find out, he's given his life to Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, and I didn't lead him in a prayer of salvation. You know, I didn't, you know, I was just there, and God used me to brag on Jesus to him, and I'm sure a lot of other people, and I just played a small part. But then and the this rest guy, of that story, where'd you run into him? About a couple years ago, I was at this uh, youth pastor conference that they do in Orlando. It's free to youth pastors. I love going every year, and I happened to run into him there. He was there as a youth worker. Amen. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? So, so you never know how God's going to use you. I wanted you to hear this story because this is exactly what Peter was describing. You just live your life with Jesus in front of people and see what God will do with it. Are you willing to do that? Just be, be real for Christ and you'll be amazed at what God will do with it. Thank you, Juan. That's a great word, brother. Father, thank you. Let us be real for you. In Jesus' name.